Take a look at this cooler from ID Cooling. This is the Frozen A410 DK cooler. Uh, it's a single tower, dual fan, all in black, no RGB lighting on this one. Now, ID Cooling did reach out to me and asked if I'd be interested in taking a look at some of their new coolers coming out. And I said, sure, send them on over. So I've been doing some builds in this Musetex case here. Check out that video if you're interested. Uh, but I wanted to get some more air coolers to check out with this case and kind of do some more testing. This is a great cooler to upgrade uh, your stock coolers. I'm going to be looking at AMD today, but Intel will be the same way. Uh, this is a great budget entry cooler uh, to get you started. Taking a look at this cooler, it's 152 millimeters high. So most cases should accommodate that, but check the specification of your case before you purchase this. It's got an aluminum fin stack with a plastic cap on here and the logo Frozen is embedded in here. It comes with a nice protective cover on here. And I think overall, it's just a very sharp looking cooler. But the overall dimensions, obviously 152 millimeters high, 120 millimeters wide. It'll be 98 millimeters with both fans attached to it. Now the A410 DK does come with two fans included in the box. These are 120 millimeter fans. They're 25 millimeters thick. Uh, they have rubber pads on them for noise dampening. Uh, they each have a four pin PWM connector. Uh, the kit also does include a splitter so that you can join those two together and just use a single uh, header on your motherboard or a controller. Now this is model number AF-125-K. It has a 500 to 2000 RPM rating plus or minus 10%. The CFM rating per fan is 78.25. Uh, max noise is 29.85 decibels. That's uh, greater than or equal to that number. It is a fluid dynamic bearing. Uh, the rated startup voltage is seven volts DC and the rated, rated current while it's running is 0.25 amps, which is typical of a 120 millimeter fan. The max pressure rating is 2.68 millimeters H2O. Now you can also purchase these individually from their website if you're interested in this fan. Now the tower itself does use four copper heat pipes. These are exposed on the heat plate and the heat sink is rated for 230 watts TDP. All of the hardware to mount this on both Intel and AMD processors is included in the box. Uh, that's going to include AM4 and AM5 from AMD, uh, also LGA1200 and LGA1700 from Intel. The kit includes the tower itself obviously, the two included fans, you get the little splitter cable to join both fans together and use a single header on your motherboard or controller. Comes with a pretty nice instruction book. Check that out. Uh, they're just basic, simple drawings in here, but I think for most people, this is gonna be adequate to get you started. Uh, it includes both of the rails, one set for Intel, one set for AMD. It includes a tube of Frost X25 thermal paste from ID Cooling. This will be enough for a couple of remounts, I think. Uh, it also includes all of the hardware. This is gonna be the spacers for AMD, spacers for Intel. Uh, you know, some different cap screws and different screws for AMD. It also includes all of the fan clips. This is gonna be the clips that'll mount the fan to the cooler itself. These are just your basic common clip to mount fans to uh, an aluminum fin stack. This should have a zero interference with your RAM. I do wanna point out that the tower is kind of offset from the mounting bracket on the bottom here. Make sure that you orient it the right way. On a standard case with the ATX motherboard in the right position, if you put the Frozen logo down, you're gonna have this mounted in the right position. Uh, you can mount it either way on the mounting brackets. If you find that it is interfering with your RAM, uh, just unmount it, flip it over, and you should be in good shape. Now mounting this CPU cooler is fairly straightforward and it's gonna be typical of what you'll find in mounting most of these tower style uh, CPU heatsink coolers. So to mount this on AMD, start by removing the two stock mounting brackets on the motherboard. But once you have the stock brackets removed, it's just going to leave exposed that post there where the screws went into. You're going to take the red spacers from the cooling kit and you're going to place those over the top of the mounting posts on your existing back plate. But for AMD, you're going to take the curved brackets and they're only going to fit one way, just one on each side. If you put it in the wrong way, it won't line up. You'll see what I mean. Uh, but basically, you're going to take that, place it on top of the spacer and then use the included four screws and you're going to then screw and attach these to your existing back plate. Uh, do both sides, there's four screws total and two mounting brackets. They don't need to be overly tight, just tighten them down so it's not gonna come loose. You don't need to wrench it down there really super hard. But once you have that mounted down, these two cross members uh, have a little stud on here and that is what the heat sink is going to attach to. After you've got the mounting brackets in place, go ahead and mount your processor if you haven't already. 
and then you can use the included ID cooling paste, the Frost X25, or use your favorite cooling paste if you don't want to use this. But once you get the bracket installed and your thermal paste applied, go ahead and line up your heat sink, line up the post to the screw holes on the tower, and go ahead and tighten these down. There is a full stop on that screw and it's spring loaded, so it should maintain the correct amount of pressure. Now the two fans, you're gonna mount them on the cooler using a push-pull configuration. And generally speaking, the front fan is gonna have the open face of the fan towards the front of your case or towards the front of your airflow. And the rear fan is gonna mount face forward into the fin stack itself. Now to mount the fan, you just wanna take your clip and on the front fan that's gonna be facing towards the front of your case, uh, on the open exposed fan face, just go ahead and put the clip into the two holes and it will kind of hold itself there. So you can go ahead and put your other clip on the other side. Once you have the clips in, go ahead and line it up flush on your cooler. And then you kind of just kind of stretch that clip into the groove on the cooler. There's, there's two grooves on the fin stack, uh, one for the front fan, one for the rear fan. And it's designed for that clip to just kind of fit right down in there. Just stretch it, pull it in there, and it will hold that fan nice and tight. And go ahead and just repeat that process for the rear fan. Obviously the rear fan, you're gonna put the clips on the back, coming to the front, because you want that open fan facing into the heat sink this time. Just orient your cables. It doesn't matter which way the fan really is rotated on the cooler. I just like to get the cables facing on the bottom, of course, that'll just look the best and make it easy to do your cable management. Once you have the cooler and the fans connected and mounted, you can then go ahead and connect your fans uh, to the included splitter cable. Again, this just gives you a single point of connection uh, for both four pin PWM fans. Of course, you can mount them to your own controller, a motherboard header, your CPU fan header, uh, with however you want to control it. Now installing this on an Intel socket is gonna largely be the same experience. Uh, the first difference is gonna be you're gonna to need to use the included back plate. Uh, this back plate does have some adjustable posts on here. There's just kind of some wiggle room with this. Uh, this will allow you to get it on the supported Intel sockets, uh, but you will need to put this on there. But once you get this through the back of your board, there's some rubber spaces here that you need to apply over the tops of these posts. That'll kind of help hold it in place. Uh, you will then need to choose which color of the spacers you're gonna use. The LGA 1200 is the gray ones, and LGA 1700 will be the black ones. But regardless of which spacer you're gonna use, it's gonna be the same installation. Put your spacer down, and then go ahead and apply the cross member across the two posts, and then use the included cap screws here to secure that down. And once you have that done, then it's essentially the same installation. Uh, just choose the right orientation for your tower, uh, put it down, line up the screw holes, tighten them down, and you are ready to go. Obviously, you will need to put your uh, processor in and apply your thermal paste to get started. But once you've got the installation done, you're ready to power up your PC, I would just recommend check and make sure that your fans are running on your first power up. Uh, you know, it's not impossible to get a cable or something else in there to obstruct that fan from running. So I would just make sure immediately that your fans are running freely. As far as the performance of the heatsink, I did a couple of basic tests here. Um, I tested this on an X570 motherboard. I tested it with both a 5600X and a 3800X CPU from AMD. I did compare and contrast it to these stock coolers. Uh, there's no doubt that this is gonna perform better than those, but I just wanted to kind of give a comparison you know, in the numbers as to what these did in my specific test. Uh, all I did with this is I left it the stock BIOS uh, everything on auto. I did apply the XMP profile for the RAM here, installed Windows, uh, updated all the drivers, made sure we're on the latest BIOS for this particular motherboard. So for the second set of tests, I did apply an overclock to this board and set all of the voltages. So there really shouldn't have been too much on auto and really ran it under the same conditions in Windows. Now for all of the tests, I managed the ambient air at 21 degrees. So for each configuration, I did three tests. I did one with the fans at 35 decibels at 20 inches. Uh, the second set, I just ran the fans at 100%, regardless of uh, you know, what RPM that gave. And for the third set, I just let it sit idle for a little while, not running anything or doing anything in particular. First up, I tested the 3800X. And again, this is gonna be with the stock, uh, bio settings, everything in auto. And with the Ryzen platform, of course, that means that the motherboard and the CPU is going to try to find the fastest frequency uh, based on power, temperature, a whole lot of different things. And because of that, these tests aren't really gonna be matching up to what you would be able to get. This is gonna be specific to this board, processor, 
uh, you know, the exact chip, everything that's running on Windows, that installation, and a whole bunch of other factors that are going to be really hard to recreate. It really, it's just meant to draw a comparison between the stock heat sinks and the A410DK. Now, for the 3800X, uh, I started out with using the stock Wraith Prism Cooler, that, and obviously then I switched over to the A410DK. Now, as far as the first test, I ran it at 100% fan speed, and on the stock Wraith Prism, I got 79.36. And on the ID cooling, I got 73.54, so a pretty good improvement there. And uh, 35 decibels, and again, that's going to change just based on the fact that there's two fans here and one fan here. Um, I got 85.07 on the stock Wraith Prism, and I got 76.66 on the ID cooling. At idle speeds, uh, on the stock Wraith Prism, I measured 31.18 and on the ID cooling major 28.18. Switching over to the 5600X, the stock cooler for that is the Wraith Stealth Cooler, uh, which is a pretty small cooler, uh, adequate for stock settings on that, really not meant for overclocking at all. For the 100% fan test, and again, this is running Cinebench for 30 minutes and then just averaging out the T-Dye values that I got during the test. Uh, for the 100% fan test, I got 80.15 for the Wraith Stealth and 56.4 for the ID. So for the 35 decibel test, again, it's not a fair comparison with just one fan here and two fans on the ID cooling test. Uh, the temperatures I got was 86.58 on the Wraith Stealth and 58.21 on the ID cooling fan. So again, a significant improvement for the 5600X and the stock cooler at 35 decibels and an idle setting, I uh, got 32.41 uh, Celsius as an average and for the ID cooling on the 5600X, uh, 35 decibels, uh, 26.72. So again, a significant improvement. So the next test, I went ahead and put an overclock on this motherboard. And for the 3800X, I went to 4.3 gigahertz on here and just made sure it was stable, uh, set all of the voltage settings so that, you know, tried to get everything out of auto that I could. And I performed the same test suite on here at 100% fan speed on the Wraith Prism. I got 73.14 Celsius. On the ID cooling cooler, I got 65.2. For the 35 dBA fan test, uh, for the Wraith Prism, got 74.15 C uh, compared to 67.33 on the ID cooling cooler. On the idle speed with fans at 35 decibels, I got 37.16 for the Wraith Prism and 32.31 for the ID cooling. So for the 5600X, I put an overclock of 4.2 gigahertz on here and ran it again with the Wraith Stealth and the ID cooling cooler. The results I got for that definitely demonstrated that the Wraith Stealth is not intended for overclocking. Uh, for the 100% fan test, I got 93.15 C on the Wraith Stealth, 60.38 on the ID cooling. Uh, so it did complete the test, but it really, that's not how you should be running that. That's, that, that's it's too much for this little cooler. Uh, don't do it. I would say if you have a CPU with the Wraith Stealth, yeah, really consider stepping up to something uh, that's an improvement, unless you're just running stock settings and everything's going good. Now, because I didn't have enough thermal paste from ID cooling to do all of those tests, because I was unmounting and repasting it every time uh, I was switched over processors and heat sinks, uh, I did use this thermal paste from Thermal Hero. This is the Ultra Thermal Paste. I'll link to this in the description below if you're interested. All of the thermal paste I've used for these tests was provided to me from Be Quiet. Now, they didn't sponsor or pay for this video. They just sent some samples over for me to check out. Let me know if you've used Thermal Hero Paste in the past. Uh, what do you think of it? Pros, cons, whatever. Uh, but I did do some tests with the ID Cooling Thermal Paste. And the results I got on that, again, this is uh, with the 3800X uh, with the BIOS in the overclocked uh, configuration to 4.3 gigahertz. The idle speed was 31.27. 100% fan speed test was 64.76. And comparing that pace to the Thermal Hero stuff I was using before, it was pretty comparable. I didn't notice any drop effect. It scored you know, slightly better in the 100% fan test and the 35 dB test. And also it scored a little bit better in the idle test. But the ID cooling thermal paste uh, seems to be adequate. Uh, it's a little bit thicker, a little bit tougher to spread. I like to put down a pea-sized amount and then kind of spread it out with a spatula. Uh, this is kind of thick and takes a little bit of work to get it spread out like that. 
But overall, I think the A410 DK is a good little cooler. Definitely a good step up from the race stealth if you're on something like that, or even on the Intel side, some of the smaller uh, coolers. Uh, you know, as expected, the Wraith Prism's kind of in the middle there, but this definitely is a good step up. I think right on Amazon right now as I'm filming this, it's about $34.99. So this would be great for first time builders, budget builds, if you're using some of the you know lower wattage processors, even some of the moderate range processors. For some of the higher end CPUs, this probably isn't gonna be quite what you're looking for. Uh, they do make some dual tower coolers as well as some water coolers, which I'll look at one here in a couple of weeks that they provided to me. Uh, anyways, I will link to ID Cooling. Uh, check them out, see what products they've got out there. But overall, I think this is a great looking cooler. It's performed well. I don't have a whole lot of other comparisons as far as coolers in this range to say this is the best one out there, uh, but definitely for the testing I did, it would be adequate for what I would be doing with it. I hope to be doing some more cooler reviews coming up. I'd be interested in coolers that you think suck, really, that's what I'm kind of interested in. What coolers do you think are not good at all that I could take a look at and maybe compare and contrast that to some of these coolers? But let me know some good ones, some bad ones, if you know what they are, or things that you want me to take a look at. I'd be happy to run through and test them. They take a little bit of time, uh, but it's fun to mess around with it. But that is going to do it for today. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.